and no one's employing me because I'm so small and skinny and weak. I've come here to beat you. 60,000 people came to Baghdad to pray his Salatul Janazah. 60,000 people came to pray his Salatul Janazah. And the one who enters the realm of spirituality without having studied the Zandaq will become an atheist, will lose his religion. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa aftalu salati wa atamu taslim ala sharaf al anbiya Muhammadin al mabuuthi rahmatan lil alameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, collectively, if everybody can recite salawat, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin wa ala Ali Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin wa ala Ashabi Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin wa barik wa sallim salatan wa salaman alayka ya Sayyidi ya Rasulullah wa ala alika wa ashabika ya Sayyidi ya rahmatan lil alameen. Alhamdulillah, it's an uh, honor to be here. I'd like to thank um, Ihya Academy my brothers and sisters for uh, inviting me, honor, honoring me with this invitation uh, to spend some moments speaking about the great man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a huge blessing for me. Uh, we are only allowed to speak about Allah's beloveds with Allah's permission. Without Allah's permission, you cannot speak about His beloveds. So this is a, a huge blessing for me to be able to speak about this great man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as Sayyidina Sufyan bin Uyayna radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, one of the great awliya and saints of the Salaf who said, عِنْدَ ذِكْرِ الصَّالِحِينَ تَنْزِلُ rahma That when the Salihin, the righteous are mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy descends. So in these uh, monthly gatherings, story nights, you speak about the great men of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the great women of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the great awliya and Salihin. And by the mention of any one of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send His mercies. So the monthly gathering like this is not an ordinary gathering. It's not just a gathering where you're listening to a story. But these gatherings are gatherings where we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We remember the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We remember the beloveds of Allah. And by this blessing, we receive Allah's mercy. Insha'Allah. So um, understand that these gatherings are very blessed. Today, inshallah, I'm going to be speaking about the great Sayyiduna Junaid al-Baghdadi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I'm going to start off from his uh, f famous story, story night, so I'll start off with a story, inshallah. Sayyiduna Junaid Baghdadi radiallahu anhu, though his upbringing, which I'm going to cover, I'm going to speak about his tarbiyah and his upbringing. Though his upbringing was an upbringing of ruhaniyyah, of spirituality, Junaid al-Baghdadi was uh, known when he was in his teens, he was very big, he was strong and something that was very common in the time of Junaid al-Baghdadi was wrestling. Wrestling was very common, wrestling, not nowadays WWE wrestling, we're talking about real wrestling, okay, it's called grappling, where you try to, you, you don't hit the other person, but you try to get them on the floor and once you've put the person's shoulders onto the floor, You've beaten that person. Okay, so wrestling like this, grappling, which is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Junaid al Baghdadi radiallahu taala anhu was one of the best grapplers. He was one of the best wrestlers. He became so famous that the Khalifa of the time in Baghdad made him the royal wrestler. So Junaid al Baghdadi became the royal wrestler. He became the best wrestler in the king, the kingdom, or in the caliphate. He was the best wrestler. So whenever, you know, there'd be a, like a weekly or a monthly match, the Khalifa of the time would make an announcement. And that announcement was that, come and fight my royal wrestler, Junaid al-Baghdadi. Fight him, and if you beat him, then you'll be given riches, you'll be given gold and silver, you'll be given land, you'll be given so much. And every single week or every single month, the match would be organized, and Junaid al-Baghdadi would stand there, and people would come to him to fight, and he would defeat every single person. Any person that would come in front of him, he would beat them all. People from all around the city, the city that he was uh, from is known as Baghdad. That's why it's called Baghdadi. So in Baghdad, people would travel from all around Baghdad and all around the surrounding areas of Baghdad. They would come to Baghdad once a month, 
and they would fight Junaid al-Baghdadi, Junaid al-Baghdadi would always defeat them. One day what happened was that a fight had been organized between Junaid Baghdadi and he came forward. An announcement was made that whoever has come to fight Junaid Baghdadi, come forward. So one person came forward, a big person came forward to fight Junaid Baghdadi. So they had their wrestling match, they had their grappling match. Junaid Baghdadi took this man, this big man, took him, floored him to the ground, beat him. So he lost and he went. Another person came again, he's big, he's come from far to fight Junaid Baghdadi. Junaid Baghdadi fights him. They hold shoulders and he drops him to the ground, beats him as well. After he's beaten these two huge people, he looks around and he calls the people, is there anybody else? Anybody else who wants to fight? Anybody else who wants to come and have this wrestling, grappling match with me? And the crowd's watching, because obviously the crowds come here to watch this, uh, this wrestling match. A small, skinny person comes from the corner. He comes out and he says, I'm going to fight you. So he's just beaten the strongest people. He's beaten them all. He's beaten the big people, the strong people, beaten everyone. A small, skinny person comes from the side, squeezes through the people. And he says, I'm going to fight you. Everyone looks at him and thinks, what are you going to do? Junaid Baghdadi is the royal wrestler. He's defeated everybody. What are you going to do? You're so small, you're so skinny. You can't do anything. He says, no, I'm going to fight. The small, skinny person says, no, I'm going to fight him. Just give me a chance. Just give me a chance. I'm going to fight him. So they say, okay, they think this is funny, this is a joke. You've got this big royal wrestler on one side and you've got this skinny person on one side, small and skinny, and what's going to happen? So Junaid Baghdadi thinks, okay, might as well, you know, beat him as well. So as they're about to wrestle, the small skinny person comes up to Junaid Baghdadi, you know, and they face each other. I don't know if it's the same as nowadays. If you watch boxing, they just face each other and they're really angry. But they come face to face. On one side is Junaid Baghdadi, the royal wrestler. On the other side, this small skinny person who's come from, nobody knows where he's from. He comes and he faces Junaid Baghdadi. He says, come here. So Junaid Baghdadi comes close. And he whispers something into Junaid Baghdadi's ears. He whispers something into his ears. When Junaid Baghdadi hears it, he stands back. And he's shocked. What he whispers into his ears is this. That Junaid Baghdadi, I know you are the royal wrestler and I know you've beaten everybody but I am a family member of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I am a Sayyid, I am a Sharif, I am a Shah, I'm from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I am very poor and my family they're very poor but I have children and I've been trying to find work so I can earn an income and a livelihood for my children, but I can't find work because I'm so weak. Nobody's employing me. Anybody looks at me, they think, what bricks are you going to pick up? No one's giving me a job. And because I'm a Sayyid, we can't take charity because the family of the Prophet are not allowed to take zakat, they're not allowed to take charity. So you think, I can't take charity because I'm a Sayyid and no one's employing me because I'm so small and skinny and weak. I've come here to beat you. And I'm going to beat you and I'm going to win and I'm going to take everything, I'm going to go and look after my family with this. When Junaid Baghdadi hears this, remember I said to you, Junaid Baghdadi, though he's a wrestler, his, when he grew up, he grew up with the tarbiyat, with the nurturing, that you respect and love the family of the Prophet So when he hears this, now he's thinking, what shall I do? What shall I do? If I don't beat him, and if I let him win, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose all of my money, I'm going to lose all my fame, I'm going to lose all my status, I'm going to lose everything. But I would not have helped this Sayyid. And if I do help him and I lose this match, at least he will be happy and he will be able to look after his family. And if he is happy, then surely his grandfather, my beloved Prophet وسلم, will also be happy. So. After he's whispered this into the ears of Junaid Baghdadi, Junaid Baghdadi is standing there thinking, okay, so shall I beat him or shall I not beat him? He's thinking, shall I beat him? He's weighing this in his mind. If I beat him, then I've kept everything, but I've upset the Sayyid. And if I don't beat him, he's going to be happy, but I'm going to lose everything. 
Junaid Baghdadi makes up his mind. And he's, what conclusion does he come to? The conclusion he comes to is this. My love for my Prophet وسلم, is more than my love for this world. I love my Prophet وسلم, more than I love everything else. I love the family of my Prophet وسلم, more than I love everything else. So he's made up his mind. I'm going to lose this match. But because I have to make it look like I've, you know, I can't just lose. I have to make it look like I've had a proper fight. So then Junaid Baghdadi enters this fight with this small and skinny Sayyid, this uh, sh uh, Sharif, this family member of the Prophet وسلم, and they fight. And Junaid Baghdadi, he's pretending like he's fighting, but eventually he trips himself up, falls onto the ground, he grabs the Sayyid and places the Sayyid on top of himself. <laughs> and he said, oh, I can't believe it, I've lost. I've lost and people are shocked that how on earth did you just lose? Junaid Baghdadi is like, I've lost, that's it, end of story. And people are like, no, no, you slipped. You slipped, that's not fair. So they started supporting Junaid Baghdadi. You slipped, you need to, you need to have a, you know, best out of three. Have another one. So the Sayyid says, okay, let's do it again. Junaid Baghdadi says, okay, that's fine. <laughs> because the Sayyid knows that he's, he's made his intention to lose. So then they have the second match. Junaid Baghdadi falls to the ground and puts a Sayyid on top of himself and pins himself. He says, I've lost again. People are like, no, 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 look, this can't happen. You're the royal wrestler. This can't happen. Best out of five. So Junaid Baghdadi is trying to lose. The crowd is like, no, no, you can't lose. You're the best. Junaid Baghdadi says, okay, I'm going to fight him one more time. This will be the last. They have the third match. And Junaid Baghdadi, again, he trips himself up, falls to the ground. And he makes the Sayyid win the match. As a result of this, all the people come. They pick up the Sayyid and they completely ignore Junaid Baghdadi. They just put him to the side. You're, you're a loser, you can move to the side. Pick up the Sayyid and they take him to the, the Khalifa, the Caliph, who gives him gold and silver, gives him money, gives him land, gives him everything. You've beaten the royal wrestler and I've said I'm going to give you. So he gives him enough that he will be sorted for many years. Where's Junaid Baghdadi? He's on the side. He's lost all his money, lost his gold, lost his silver, lost his fame, he's lost everything. But he knows that he's lost it, so the beloved Prophet ﷺ can be pleased with him. So he forget, that's fine. So he goes home. He is upset in, the, in, the, in, the, in his heart, he's upset that he's lost everything. But he continuously tells himself, look, you have lost everything for the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So Junaid Baghdadi goes home. And he's upset, but at the same time he's, he's satisfied with what he's done. He goes to sleep. In his house, he goes to sleep. And when the eyes of his head close, the eyes of his heart wake up. And he is granted a dream, he is granted a vision. He sees a dream, and in the dream, he sees the beloved Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet approaches Junaid Baghdadi in the dream and says, Junaid, you have given up everything for the respect and the honor of my family. You have given up the leadership of this world, the fame of this world, for the sake of my family. O oh, Junaid, I give you something better. And some stories mention that the Prophet ﷺ in the dream took a cloak, uh, like a shawl. And then the Prophet ﷺ wrapped the shawl around Junaid Baghdadi. And in another story, the Prophet ﷺ takes an imama, a turban, and places it on the head of Junaid al-Baghdadi. The Prophet ﷺ says to him, you have given up the whole world and the leadership of the world for the sake of my family. Because of this, I give you the leadership of all of the saints of the world. So Junaid Baghdadi wakes up from this dream. He's just seen the Prophet ﷺ in his dream. Imagine this. He just saw the Prophet ﷺ in his dream. And the Prophet ﷺ is happy with him that he has helped the family member of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ gives him the bashara, the good news, the glad tidings that you are now going to be crowned. You're not, you've lost the crown of being the royal wrestler, but I'm giving you the crown of Sultanul Awliya, the king of the saints. When he wakes up, he hears a knock at the door. He hears a knock at the door. So he comes to the door of his house, he opens the door, and in front of the door of his house are all of the awliya of the world standing with their heads bowed down. 
as an indication to the acceptance of Junaid Baghdadi in the court of the Prophet ﷺ that yes, you are now crowned the king of all the awliya. This is that Junaid Baghdadi radiallahu ta'ala anhu who gave up his fame, his money, everything. Why? So that he can serve the Prophet ﷺ. Because serving the family of the Prophet ﷺ is serving the Prophet ﷺ. I'm going to mention a few things about this Junaid Baghdadi. Junaid Baghdadi didn't just happen. He wasn't just born as Junaid Baghdadi. He wasn't this great wali just like that. There was something behind it. So let's learn a bit more about this great man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Junaid al-Baghdadi is from even before the time of Sultan al-Awliya, Sayyiduna Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Junaid al-Baghdadi is before... You know, Masha brother Harun, we came together and he was asking me about which silsila Junaid al-Baghdadi was from. Junaid al-Baghdadi is before all of the major silsilas. Before Sultan al-Awliya Sayyiduna Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. Before Baha- shah Naqshaband, Bahauddin Naqshaband. Before Shaykh al-Shuyukh Shah, Shah Shihabuddin Suharwardi. Before Khwaja Gharib Nawaz, Mu'inuddin Chishti Ajmeri. Before Ahmed Kabir Rifai. Before all the major awliya is Junaid al-Baghdadi. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He is from the shaykhs of Sayyidina Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was born in year, I'm going to stick to the English years because it makes it easier for everyone to remember. He was born in year 830. Which year? 830. 830. Which year are we in now? Which year are we in now? 2024. 2024. Are you sure? Positive? Negative? Okay, that's fine. 2024, Junaid Baghdadi was born round about year 830. ta'ala anhu. He was born in a, in, a, in a religious family. MashaAllah, his mother and his father were both religious people. They were both worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They both recited Quran. They were both lovers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was born uh, Persian. So his mother tongue was Farsi. His mother tongue was not Arabic. His mother tongue was Farsi. Just like Sayyidina Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, Ghosi Azam, Ghosi Pak. The language was a Farsi language. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When he was very small, his father passed away. So he was actually very young, four or five years old, and his father passed away. Sayyidina Shaykh uh, Junaid Baghdadi, his full name was Junaid bin Muhammad bin Junaid. So his name was Junaid, his father's name was Muhammad, and his grandfather's name was Junaid again. And he's called Baghdadi because he's from the city of Baghdad. His father um, was a businessman who would, who would sell glass. Would sell glass. So they also called the Zajjaj family or the Qawariri family. So sometimes you will see with the name of Junaid Baghdadi, Imam al-Ta'ifa, Sayyid al-Ta'ifa, Sayyiduna al-Junaid ibn Muhammad, Ibn al-Junaid al-Baghdadi al-Qawariri al-Zajjaj radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. So these are titles that are added to his name. So he was from, outwardly, he's from a normal family. His mom and dad were practicing in the term that they would pray their namaz. They would recite Quran. They were lovers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His father was a businessman who would buy and sell glass. That was his job. And some say he would buy and sell fur, wool and fur. So they're also known as Al-Khazaz because they were uh, fur merchants. It was a normal family. But th- they would earn a halal income, pray namaz. Sometimes when we hear the stories of the great awliya, we hear that their, their parents would worship so much. We have no doubt that his parents are very righteous. But outwardly, ostensibly, th- they were normal people who worshipped Allah, who recited Quran, who loved the Prophet وسلم, and who earned a halal income. <coughs> when his father passed away, his mother <coughs> then gave her son, so Junaid Baghdadi's mother, imagine Junaid Baghdadi is four or five years old, so Junaid Baghdadi's mother gave her son to her brother to look after because her brother was no ordinary person. Her brother was one of the greatest 
awliya of his time, Sayyiduna Sariya Sakati, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, also known as Siri Sakti. Siri Sakti or Sariya Sakati, radiyallahu anhu, is one of the greatest scholars of Baghdad. He was the Mamu of Junaid Baghdadi. You know what Mamu is? You do know what Mamu is? MashaAllah. That's good. Mamu is, what is it? Tell everyone. What is Mamu? Your mom's brother. brother. Yes, MashaAllah. Anyone's Mamu here? No, no one's Mamu is here. Okay. MashaAllah. Don't give the children in their responsibility then. (coughs) (laughs) (laughs) But Junaid Baghdadi's mother gave Junaid Baghdadi to his Mamu, Siriya Sakti radiallahu ta'ala anhu to look after. So his tarbiyah, we're going to speak about when he was a young boy. His uncle, his mamu, Siriya Sakti used to teach him. Would make him attend classes to learn Quran, to learn the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is very important because when we're going to speak about Junaid Baghdadi as one of the greatest imams, I'm going to tell you why this is important. He studied Quran. The way you children are studying Quran. He studied the hadith of the Prophet. ﷺ. He studied fiqh, Islamic law. It is mentioned that at the age of 10, he had memorized the whole Quran. At the age of 10, Sayyidina Junaid Baghdadi had memorized the Quran. He had memorized, he was memorizing books of hadith. He was studying fiqh, Islamic law. And by the age of 20, Junaid Baghdadi was one of the main scholars of fiqh in Baghdad in the Shafi'i school. Junaid al-Baghdadi would give a fatwa according to the madhab qadim of Imam Shafi'i. So Imam Shafi'i has two, you can say two sub-schools, the old school and the later school. Junaid Baghdadi would give fatwa at the age of 20 in Baghdad, where you had some of the greatest scholars. Amongst the greatest of scholars, Junaid Baghdadi is standing there at the age of 20 and giving fatwa. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Junaid al-Baghdadi, when he was only seven years old, his mamu took him for hajj. Seven years old and his mamu took him for hajj. We should, and it's good if you can take your children to the Haramain Sharifain, to visit Makkah al-Mukarramah and Madina al-Munawwara, zadahum Allahu sharafan wa ta'zima wa takrima. You should take them there to see the Kaaba, to see uh, Masjid Nabwi, to go to the Roza Mubarak, Rawda al Sharifa, Al Muwajaha, Al Sharifa, Al Karima, Ala Sahibiha, Al Salatu Was Salam. Take them to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do this tarbiyah of your children from young age. You know the great Ibrahim bin Adham, one of the great awliya, uh, before even Junaid Baghdadi. Ibrahim bin Adham, his m- father was a king. His father was a king and his mother was a queen. And when she was expecting him in her womb, they both traveled on Hajj. They went and done Hajj. And as she was doing Hajj, she gave birth to Ibrahim bin Adham. And they would take their child to every righteous person they could see. They would take their baby to that righteous person and they would say, do dua for our child. Do dua for our child. As a result of going, taking your children to the righteous, taking their child to the righteous and the uh, salihin, the result of that became that their son Ibrahim bin Adham, who inherited the kingdom, Ibrahim bin Adham became a king. But Ibrahim bin Adham had it inside his heart that I need to leave my kingdom and I need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The story of Ibrahim bin Adham, that one day Ibrahim bin Adham is sitting on his throne as a king. And a person comes into the, the castle, a man comes into the castle and he looks around the castle and he says, this is a very nice hotel. He says about the castle, this is a very nice hotel. Ibrahim bin Adham says, this is not a hotel, this is my castle. The old man says, is your, is your castle? He says, yes. He says, well, who lived here before you? He said, my dad. He said, who lived here before your dad? He said, his dad. He said, who's going to live here after you? He said, my son. Sound like a hotel to me. <laughs> Sounds like a hotel to me. So Ibrahim bin Adam starts thinking, you know what, he is right. So one, that very night, Ibrahim bin Adam's in his bed. And he's thinking, I really need to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's sleeping in his bed. All of a sudden, he hears footsteps on the roof. What does he hear? What does he hear? Footsteps, footsteps on, the, on the roof. 
So Junaid Bagh, um, Ibrahim bin Adham gets up from his bed and he says, who's there? Who's, imagine someone walking on your roof. He says, who's there? He's not Santa. <laughs> I heard that. Someone's working on the roof. Who's there? Ibrahim bin Adham says. The person on top of the roof says, I've lost my camel. I've lost my camel. Ibrahim bin Adam says, you're strange. Why are you looking for a camel on my roof? And the man on the roof says, you're even more stranger. How are you looking for Allah's pleasure inside your bed? You want Allah's pleasure and you're lying in bed? In reality, this was a message from Allah. And as a result of that, Ibrahim bin Adham left his kingdom and disappeared into the wilderness to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the result of what? This is the result of taking your children to the righteous. Junaid al-Baghdadi's mamu, who himself is righteous, would take him, took him at the age of seven for hajj. On this journey of hajj, they met 400 awliya. They met 400 people of Allah. And with every single one, they would say, please do dua for us. Please make dua for us. Of course, he's going to become Junaid al-Baghdadi. He's got the dua of 400 awliya. Junaid Baghdadi performed hajj 30 times, walking barefoot all the way to Mecca from Baghdad. From Baghdad, he walked all the way to Mecca and he done hajj 30 times. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This Junaid al-Baghdadi, radiallahu anhu. Once, Junaid Baghdadi himself says, he says, I was seven years old. How old are you? Eight. You're, eight, you're a bit too old now. You're seven years old. Junaid Baghdadi says, when I was seven years old, I was with my mamu, Siriya Sakti, and I was playing. Al-Ab, I was playing in front of them. And all around, because his mamu was one of the great scholars of Baghdad, there were scholars all around the gathering. They were all scholars. So imagine a gathering just full of scholars. And they were speaking about shukr. They are speaking about being grateful to Allah. So they're all speaking, what, what is shukr? Tell us what is shukr. So a hadith scholar is saying what he thinks is shukr. A tafsir scholar is saying what he thinks is shukr. A Sufi is saying what he thinks is shukr. A grammarian is saying. So all scholars are talking about shukr. Siriya Sakti looks at his nephew, seven years old. says, Junaid, what do you think is shukr? Junaid, what is shukr? Junaid Baghdadi, seven years old, says, Allah ya'asillaha bi ni'ami. That you do not disobey Allah and take his bounties. You take Allah's blessings and then you disobey him. Doesn't make sense. Seven years old and he makes such a statement. He says, shukr is that you receive Allah's blessings and you don't disobey him. And then all the people in the gathering are like, wow. Siriya Sakti then says, I fear for you. <laughs> I'm scared for you, Junaid, that this is going to be very powerful. This tongue of yours is going to be very powerful. It might put you into a problem. Because as you will see, when he grew up, he would only speak the truth regardless of the people that were in front of him. If the person was powerful, he would still speak the truth. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Junaid al-Baghdadi, he, as he's studying, he's under his mamu, he's studying. That's very important, I keep repeating the word studying. He's studying. He didn't just become Junaid Baghdadi is studying. One day his mamu hears that Junaid Baghdadi is teaching in the masjid. But he hasn't given him permission. So Siriya Sakti says to his nephew Junaid Baghdadi, Are you teaching study circles in the masjid? He says, No, I'm just, you know, just having discussions. Junaid Baghdadi says, no, uh, his uncle, Siriya Sakti says, no, no, you're not ready for that. Stop teaching. You still need to be nurtured. You still need to study more. You still need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. So he took him away. So he can train him, train him, train him. Eventually a time came where his uncle, Siriya Sakti, said to him himself, Takallamun nas. So he reached a certain age where his uncle says to him, now you go to the masjid, now you can teach. You've reached a, a station where now you can teach the people. Junaid Baghdadi says, when my uncle said this to me, I became frightened. How am I going to speak in the center of Baghdad 
where you got scholars all around the world come here. They're the center of the Islamic world. I'm a Persian. My mother tongue is Persian. How am I going to even speak? So he didn't go to teach. He didn't go to lecture. He stayed at home and he went to sleep and he had a dream and he saw the Prophet ﷺ in the dream. These are blessed houses. Every other person is going to sleep in Baghdad and seeing the Prophet ﷺ. Blessed people. You know Imam Malik bin Anas, the great Imam Malik, the founder of the Maliki school. He says, I have not gone to sleep a single night except that I saw the Prophet ﷺ. It's a very blessed people. So Junaid Baghdadi saw the Prophet ﷺ in the dream. And the Prophet ﷺ says to Junaid Baghdadi, go and speak. It's time for you to go and speak. So Junaid Baghdadi says, I woke up and I rushed to the house of my mamu, Siriya Sakti. I knocked the door. Siriya Sakti, my mamu, opened the door. He smiles at me and he says, why didn't you go when I told you? <laughs> I told you already. Why didn't you go? Now that you've been commanded by the Prophet ﷺ, you have to go. So the people went into the streets, they made an announcement. Junaid al-Baghdadi, the nephew of Siriya Sakti, is going to give a lecture. People start rushing to the masjid because they've heard about him. But he's been prevented from speaking. But he's going to speak now. So people gathered in the central masjid of Baghdad. Junaid al-Baghdadi is now standing on the mimbar, the chair that the Imam stands on. He's standing on the mimbar. The masjid is completely packed out. Junaid al-Baghdadi is speaking, he's lecturing. All of a sudden, a man stands up from the middle of the gathering, who's actually a Christian. But he's heard about Junaid Baghdadi and he's like, I'm going to come and I'm going to ask him a very difficult question. And I'm going to make him look bad in front of the people. So this man stands up, he's really a Christian, but he's dressed up like a Muslim. So he's got his cross underneath, he's got his clothes, but on top of that, He's wearing like a jubba, like this, and he's covered. So outwardly, he's just dressed like a Muslim. So he stands up in the middle of the gathering and he says, Junaid, Ibn Muhammad, Ibn Junaid, I've got a question for you. <coughs> Your Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, pretending to be a Muslim, has said, Ittaqu firasat al-mu'min, fa innahu yanzuru bi nurillah. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, Ittaqu firasat al-mu'min, fear, the sight of the believer. فَإِنَّهُ يَنْظُرُ بِنُورِ اللَّهِ Because the believer sees with the light of Allah. What does this mean, Junaid Baghdadi? The biography is mentioned, Junaid Baghdadi put his head down. Then he raised his head and he looked at this undercover Christian and he says, right now, the meaning of this hadith is, take off your garbs, your clothes, Remove that cross from your neck and recite the shahada because the time has come for you to accept Islam. And he's amazed and shocked. Junaid Baghdadi didn't just explain to him. He showed him physically. He showed him this is what it means. I have the light of Allah in my eyes and I can see straight through you that you are a Christian who's pretending to be a Muslim. Here is not the interpretation but the actual physical a physical show and display of what this hadith means. Immediately he recited the shahada and he accepted Islam. <coughs> Junaid al-Baghdadi radiallahu ta'ala anhu <coughs> he has a title Sayyid al-Ta'ifa Imam al-Ta'ifa which means the leader of the group. It means the leader of the group of Sufi, Sufiya, the leader of the Sufis, the master and the head of the Sufis. The reason why he's called this is in the time of Junaid al-Baghdadi, as he is growing up, there were many people around Baghdad who'd claim to be people of Tasawwuf, who'd, be, who'd claim to be Sufis, but they were fake. They were not real people of Tasawwuf and Sufism. They would perform miracles, but their miracles were in reality black magic. So they'd perform black magic and tricks and illusions and many people would flock to them and say, oh, this person's performing miracles. We're going to become this person's murid. We're going to attach to this person. And people, there were many philosophers at the time who had the best language 
Junaid Baghdadi grew up in a time of many fakes. So he had a big challenge. And his challenge was that he radiallahu ta'ala anhu wanted to present Sufism, wanted to present tasawwuf correctly. So when he would speak, he would have certain topics that he would speak about, that he was well known to speak about. And inshallah, I'm going to, one of the, uh, the attendees of his gathering, Ka'bi, who was a Mu'tazali, from a different school of thought, he says regarding Junaid al-Baghdadi, رَأَيْتُ لَكُمْ فِي بَغْدَادِ شَيْخًا يُقَالُ لَهُ جُنَيْد He said, I've seen a man in Baghdad who's from amongst you, which is the Sunnis or the Sufis. I've seen a man from amongst you in Baghdad. His name is Junaid. This person says, مَا رَأَتْ عَيْنَايَ مِثْلَهُ My eyes have never seen the likes of anyone like him. I've not seen anybody like him. كَانَ الْكَتَبَةُ يَحْضُرُونَهُ لِيَلْفَاظِهِ The students attend his gathering so that they can take from his words. وَالْفَلَاسَفَةُ لِدِقَّةِ كَلَامِهِ The philosophers attend his gathering because of the, the nature of his speech, because of how fine his speech is. وَشُعَرَاءُ لِفَصَاحَتِهِ The poets attend his speech because of the eloquence of his words. And the theologians attend his gathering to understand the reality of this world. Junaid Baghdadi would speak about which topic, and I'm going to end with this, I'm just going to mention one or two of the topics of Junaid Baghdadi. Junaid al-Baghdadi radiallahu ta'ala anhu would speak about how tasawwuf is within the Quran and Sunnah, within the boundaries of Quran and Sunnah. You cannot enter the realm of Sufism, you cannot enter the realm of Tasawwuf, you cannot enter the realm of Islamic spirituality outside of Quran and Sunnah. Tasawwuf is within the boundaries of Quran and Sunnah. That's it. Tasawwuf is inside the boundaries of Quran and Sunnah. He would Radiallahu ta'ala anhu would teach for you to be a Sufi you need to learn the Quran you need to learn the Sunnah of the Prophet then you must have fiqh you must have understanding of this if you do not have knowledge you are a fake Sufi simple as that you're not a real person and that was hard to say in that time, it's very difficult to say because nearly everyone was a fake Sufi. And he's standing there on one of the biggest pulpits calling everybody out and saying, most of you are fakes. Why is it important? Two reasons. Two reasons why it is important for the murid or the salik, the aspirant, the disciple to have knowledge. Number one, so that the disciple can... The, so that the disciple can refine himself according to Quran and Sunnah. You must yourself understand fiqh. You must understand how to pray your salah correctly. What are you going to do? You say Allahu Akbar and you make a mistake. You're like, what shall I do? I'm going to call my shaykh. I mean namaz. You need to have sufficient knowledge yourself so that you can help yourself. What are you going to do? Just stand in namaz and do tasawwar. Shaykh sahab, khabay aai jau. Come to me and tell me the ruling of how I should be praying my salah. <laughs> so there's two reasons. The first reason why a disciple must have knowledge is so that the disciple can ensure that his or her actions are within the boundaries of Sharia. And listen to the second reason. It's amazing. He says, the second reason why a disciple, a person who is treading the path of spirituality, must have knowledge so that this person can judge the actions of his or her own shaykh, whether they are according to Quran and Sunnah. And if he or she finds that my shaykh's actions and words are according to the Quran and Sunnah, then I will take from my shaykh. So the shaykh has a boundary as well. If my shaykh 
is fulfilling the commands of the Quran, if my shaykh is fulfilling, abstaining from the prohibitions, then this is my shaykh. Once it is said that a man came to the great uh, Data Ali bin Uthman al-Hajwari, Data Hajwari, radiyallahu anhu, and he said, I've heard about Data Ali Hajwari, you know, Data Darbar in Lahore. I've heard about the shaykh so much. So he came and he spent a couple of days with the shaykh. Spent days and nights with the shaykh. And after the days and nights are up, three days, five days, however long it was, this person is about to leave. Data Ali Hajwari stops him and says, before you leave, tell me, why did you come? And he said, I've, I came because I heard that you have so many miracles. I, he I came because I heard you have so many miracles. And I wanted to see a miracle. But I didn't see any miracle from you. So I'm going now. <laughs> Data Ali Hajwari says to him, Did you see me leave any of Allah's commands? The man says, No. Then he says, Did you see me break any of Allah's laws? He says, No. Data Ali Hajwari says, That's my miracle. That's my miracle. I follow Quran and I follow the Sunnah of the Prophet. Junaid al Baghdadi says, if you see a person fil hawa, sitting cross legged, levitating in the sky, if you some, see someone with cross legs and the guy is levitating in the middle of the room, do not follow him. <laughs> Don't follow him. Until you see, is he fulfilling Allah's commands and staying away from Allah's prohibitions? When you see that, that is a criteria of taking spirituality from a person. You know, there was once a sheikh, a fake sheikh. He came to his disciples' house. He came to a house. And Zohar time started. Zohar time ended. Sheikh didn't read namaz. Asr time started. Asr time ended. Sheikh didn't read namaz. Maghrib time started, Maghrib time ended, Sheikh didn't read namaz. The disciples thinking, peace out namaz ani parne. You know, Sheikh's not reading namaz. So the disciple says, Hazrat, please don't mind. Um, I've not seen you read namaz. Sheikh says, look, it's a secret. I read my namaz in Medina Sharif. So I'm praying salah in Medina. So I, we have to keep that a secret. The disciple thought, okay. Now it's evening time, it's time for the meal. So it's time to have some food. So then when the time comes for food, the disciple brings out a massive dish of rice. Massive dish of rice. It's just rice though. No roast, no samosa, no kebab, no salan. No one has dal anyway. You know, <laughs> there's, there's nothing. It's just shovel, just rice. Murid puts the massive pile of rice in front of the sheikh. Sheikh looks at the rice. He says, what kind of dawat is this? What have you made for me? I'm your sheikh. You're giving me some rice? So then the murid comes, pulls out his spoon, and he starts moving the rice, and there's roast underneath. He says, sheikh, you've gone all the way to Medina to read your namaz. You couldn't see the roast under the rice. <laughs> So you have people like this, unfortunately. Our criteria, as Junaid al-Baghdadi radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, our criteria of taking spiritual guidance is Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That is what Junaid al-Baghdadi radiallahu ta'ala anhu was teaching. When you look for a guide, look for how they are with the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You know, there are some people, Raf'i Taklif, they say that we've worshipped Allah so much, we don't need to worship Allah anymore. There are people like that. So some will say, look, I've, you don't know what I read at night. I've read so much namaz at night, the rules have been lifted. So somebody came to Junaid Baghdadi and said, Shaykh, there are people, يَقُولُونَ uh, أَنَّهُمْ They say, وَصَلُوا, they have reached. What do you say about them? Junaid Baghdadi says, Sadaqu, laqad wasalu. Junaid Baghdadi says, they're telling the truth, they have reached. 
لیکن الا این الا جہنم اپنی زبان جس مینشن ہے یو نو دیس اپنی زبان دا کوئی بندہ پوچھ پوچھا نا اوکے آئی ہیو ٹو سی دس آئی ڈونٹ نو وائی اٹس جس مائی اپنی کمنگ آؤٹ اٹ سانس فنی ان اپنی زبان بندہ پوچھا نا سو دا پیپل کیم ٹو جنید بغدادی ان سیڈ دیر سم پیپل وہ آنے کے پوچھے نے جنید بغدادی سیڈ صحیح گال یا پوچھے نے لیکن جہنم اچ پوچھے نے دے ریچ بٹ دے ریچ جہنم بیکاز انٹل یور سول از ناٹ ٹیکن آؤٹ آف یور باڈی دا لوز آف دا شریا ول ناٹ بی لفٹیڈ انٹل یور سول از ناٹ ریموو فرام یور باڈی دا لوز آف دا شریا ول ناٹ بی لفٹیڈ دے ول اپلائی دے ول اپلائی وین جنید البغدادی این آل فنش ود دس ون آن ہز ڈیتھ بیڈ ہی پاسٹ اوے ان یہ Nine, ten. So he was about 77 years old when he passed away in the city of Baghdad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When he passed away, he left this world. 60,000 people came to Baghdad to pray his Salatul Janazah. 60,000 people came to pray his Salatul Janazah. And he left this world in the state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In his last breaths, in the final moments, Junaid al-Baghdadi sits up. He starts reciting Qur'an. He's got his last few breaths left. Last few breaths. He starts reciting Qur'an. And the people, there's a shaykh sitting with him. He says, shaykh, look, relax. Relax. Junaid al-Baghdadi says, my scrolls are about to be wrapped up. Let them finish with Qur'an. Meaning my life is ending, my scroll is going to get wrapped up now. Let it finish with the Qur'an. This is one of the reasons why Junaid al-Baghdadi is amongst the greatest leaders of the people of Tasawwuf. Because he was a flag bearer of Tasawwuf returning back to Qur'an and Sunnah. Our spirituality is in the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I would advise that always... Study. Always study. There is no end to your study. Min al-Mahdi ila al-Lahd. From the cradle to the grave, we will study. And inside the study is our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And alhamdulillah, I see the work that is taking place at Ihya Academy. I see it on you know, social media and also on the WhatsApp stories that brothers share. There's amazing work taking place here. Imam Burhanuddin Nazarnuji says, once you find your place of knowledge, just hold on to that. Don't let go. Once the door of knowledge has opened, enter through that door and keep studying, keep learning until the teacher himself says you've studied enough. If you think you've studied enough, you failed. If you think you've studied enough, you failed. When the teacher says that's enough of this subject or that's enough of this subject, or now go to this scholar, that is when you reach a boundary. That is when you reach a checkpoint. But if you yourself are saying, that's it, I'm done, then you failed immediately. Those brothers and sisters who are affiliated with this institution, inshallah, stay affiliated, take as much benefit as you can, serve the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ on this platform, and allow <coughs> yourselves, your family members, your friends to connect to Allah, his beloved, the awliya, Azza wa Jalla wa sallallahu wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhum ajma'een and be successful in this world and in the hereafter. Ameen bijahin nabil, ameen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakallah khairan, I'm a man of for that beautiful talk. There will be some quest Q&A session. If anyone has any questions, uh, any sisters have a question, if you please alert Sister Tayyibano, Dr. Tayyibano, and she'll pass it on. And uh, the first question is, uh, was he, was Imam Junaid al-Sadiq the Sheikh of um, Sheikh Al-Hulaj? Um, I didn't know there was a Q&A. <laughs> I thought they are asking you. Yeah, they are asking me, and then I'm asking you. <laughs> what do you think? Mansoor <laughs> al-Hulaj, um, Mansoor al-Hulaj radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Some... This discussion of Tasawwuf, some uh, people of Tasawwuf say that uh, he did not have a shaykh. He took directly, he, he took his uh, faith directly. And some do mention that he was murid of Junaid al-Baghdadi. 
Uh, I've not come across anything to suggest that is def definitive, um, that he was definitely from the murids and the disciples of Junaid Baghdadi. But there are mention, like the story I mentioned of the wrestling, it's not a definitive story, but it is mentioned. So like that, there are mention of Mansur Hallaj taking directly the faith, and some stories mention that he took through Sayyidina Junaid al-Baghdadi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And also, um, what are the signs of getting a sh finding a sheikh like Imam al Junaid uh, in this time? Um, so Imam Junaid al-Baghdadi, he speaks about taking a sheikh and he says, you must study yourself. So you must study yourself. That's the first thing. He says, awwal uh, al-ilm al-rijal. The first step of spirituality, of knowledge, is going to the people of knowledge, studying. Studying is extremely important. Imam Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, the one who studies but does not find his spiritual shaykh, he will become sinful. And the one who enters the realm of spirituality without having studied the zandaq will become an atheist, will lose his religion. And I have myself seen numerous people, myself that I've met, that enter the realm of tasawwuf, dhikr and adhkar, but they haven't studied their fard ain, and they go over the top, they lose their minds. They lose their minds. I've met a person who told me he's Imam Mahdi. I met three Imam Mahdi's, by the way. <laughs> I met three people who told me that they're Imam Mahdi. One of them, the first one, his issue was this, that he had gone into his adhkar without guidance, over the top. You have to work with guidance. If you go to the gym, and you haven't been in the gym before, and then that's it, you get into bench press, you put on two plates on both sides, you lift it, that's it, you're gone. That's it, we're reading your namazi janaza next. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. So you have to be trained. So in this realm of tasawwuf, you need to have knowledge first. Once you have knowledge of what's right and wrong, then you look for your shaykh. And when you look for your shaykh, you open your eyes. Open your eyes when you look for your shaykh. See everything about the shaykh. Once you found him, then you close your eyes. But what our people do, they keep their eyes closed from the very start. Sheikh doesn't read the Mahaz, I didn't see anything. Sheikh's there, you know, Naswar in his mouth and this, that and everything, no problem. Junaid Baghdadi's way is open your eyes, study, judge the Sheikh yourself. It sounds bad, but it's true. Judge the Sheikh yourself. Once you find him, then close your eyes. That can be anyone. Sorry, another question, general one. Uh, where in the Quran and Sunnah is proof for the Sabbath? Tasawwuf is a name that came later. The reality of Tasawwuf is found earlier. The reality of Tasawwuf, the reality of Tasawwuf is to cleanse your inside, to cleanse yourself. That is what Tasawwuf is, to cleanse your inside. It has multiple names. Tasawwuf is called Tazkiyatun Nafs, cleaning the self. Tasawwuf is also called Ihsan, perfection. It has many names. The names, Ihsan is mentioned in Hadith. Tazkiyah is mentioned in the Quran and Hadith as well. Tasawwuf as a name came later. Just like the word Fiqh as a name was applied to the schools later. But the reality of Fiqh existed before. The reality of Tasawwuf exists in the Quran and the Sunnah. And it is very simple. It is to clean yourself. But you need someone who's cleansed themselves to show you how to cleanse yourself. Ma aflaha man aflah illa bi sohbati man aflah. A person who has succeeded has only succeeded by the company of the one who has succeeded. If you want to succeed, you have to be in the company of the one who succeeds. You need training. Sorry, last question now, Mawli. Um, somebody asked about Mawli, proof for Mawli, then people say bid'ah, etc. Last question. Mawli is the, th the theoretical aspect of Mawlid is to express, express happiness on the birth of the Prophet So look, this is how you do it. Divide Mawlid, the theory and the practice. From a theoretical perspective, Mawlid is to express happiness on the birth of the Prophet That, from a theoretical perspective, you cannot deny that. We, we express happiness on the birth of the Prophet 
that from a theoretical perspective, that's in the Quran, that's in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. In the Quran, فحدث, as for the bounties of your Lord, فحدث, announce them. And the greatest bounty we are given is the Prophet ﷺ. So we announce this. And then in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ would fast on which day? Monday. Monday. Every Monday. When asked why, the Prophet ﷺ would say, he was born on Monday. Say mashallah everyone. He was born on a Monday and revelation started on a Monday. So from a theoretical perspective, to express happiness on the birth of the Prophet ﷺ is proven from Quran and Sunnah. But what happens is when you speak about this, whilst you're speaking about this, somebody will say, why do you put up flags? When you're speaking about this, somebody will say, why do you put up lights? Say, look, we'll speak about the practice after. Let's first agree that to express happiness on the birth of the Prophet ﷺ is fine, good and rewarding. Once you accept that, then we'll speak about the practice. Once that's done, then you speak about practice. Fast every Monday, that's Mawlid, done. Uh, have gatherings where we study the hadith and description of the Prophet Wasallam. You're saying that's not from the way of the Sahaba? Of course it is. Have gatherings of Nasheed, Inshad, Nat Khani, that's from the Sunnah of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, marching. If you study the Seerah of the Prophet Wasallam. The Sahaba, the Prophet ﷺ, when he entered Madinatul Munawwara, how did he enter Madinatul Munawwara? Sixty horse riders were with the Prophet ﷺ. They were holding swords, they were holding spears, they had tied their turbans and their shawls around the spears to make flags. They entered Madinatul Munawwara as a march, as a julus. So you look at the practice separate. First speak about the theory, then look at the practice. And then there are certain practices which you know, they're not necessarily that good. Uh, I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> 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 great, great talk. I have some other questions. Man, bless you and increase you. <laughs> uh, a big thank you from the president over here there. MashaAllah. Everyone here. Zakallah for the invitation. Man, um, uh, bless you and increase you. We'll just ask for a humble request for a dua. And then it'll be Salat Isha. And then it'll be food, which I think will be rice and chicken. MashaAllah. Well, sure You're going to hide the chicken under the rice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With Pakistanis, you can't hide. <laughs> MashaAllah. Um, they're going to read a nasheed. Sorry, Sorry yes, yeah, nasheed first. Uh, people are yelling.